I hope the Lord speaks to my heart tonight. I hope I hear the Holy Spirit teaching me what only the Holy Spirit can teach me with his word tonight and you and everybody out there. And so, uh, by the way, that's a little bit of a commercial. Uh, this Sunday, we're in John chapter 16, and we see once again the fourth time the Holy Spirit is referenced very specifically in what he does in our lives, as well as what he does in the, the world. But that's his Sunday. If the Lord tarries, if the Lord doesn't tarry, bless you. But most of us will be with the Lord. Um, I, I believe that. And uh, if I kind of tag this tonight, like, are you ready for that? Amen. I mean, like, I know you're ready for like heaven and stuff, but I mean, are you, are you like ready? Like your life right now is the best it can be for the Lord to come. Like, are you ready? Whether you're brand new to this and just found the Lord or you're halfway through your race, or maybe you're at the very end of your race. Are you ready? And uh, let's pretend the rapture doesn't happen. Let's pretend I die tonight. Am I ready? If my race was to end tonight, to see the Lord. You see, if I said it a different way, <clears throat> it's not how you start. It's how you finish. You guys were afraid to say it. Let me give you another chance at that. It's not how you start your race. It's how you finish. And you say, now, wait, wait, wait. I don't have to run this race. Jesus ran it for me. Well, you're half right. You're half right. Look at Philippians chapter 1 tonight as we get started. We'll be in Second Chronicles in just a minute. We're going through the whole Bible book by book and picking out some choice sermons and people from each book. So we're in Second Chronicles tonight. But I want to start in Philippians to give you the New Testament perspective before we jump back into Second Chronicles. That's okay, right? Even if you didn't think so, we're going to do it anyway. So. <clears throat> By the way, that, that would be a key to understanding your Bible. You know, without the New Testament, the New Testament explains the Old Testament. You can't understand the Old Testament without the New. And technically, you can't understand the New without the Old. Did you know that? It's one book. It's one love letter. And so it's God sent his son so that you can be saved. I mean, that's the message of this book. But the Old Testament prepares us for it. The New Testament shows us the reality. And then the illustrations from the Old Testament should be illustrations that we live. There'll be a test after this. So you'll, you'll catch on in a second. But that's why we pay attention to the whole book, nothing but the book. And so uh, you will get a boatload of verses tonight. But I, I want to start by looking at Philippians chapter 1, verse 3. That's on page 1438. Don't ever take my word for it. Make sure you see in your Bible, if you don't have one, there's one right there in front of you, page 1438, Philippians chapter 1, verse 3. You guys there? Are you there? Okay, here's what the Word of God says. Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you always, in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the very first day until now, being confident, Paul says, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Can I hear it? Amen. amen. So what Jesus, what God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, what they started in you will be completed. I mean, you can bank on it. That's what that verse is saying. Paul, as he writes back to the church of Philippi, is thanking them that I know that what Jesus started, he's going to finish. Amen. Amen? amen. In other words, it doesn't ride on you. It rides on him. In Philippians chapter 1. I believe Philippians chapter 1. God's going to complete the work he started in you. Matter of fact, um, if you jump down to verse 7, at the very end of verse 7, he says, you all see, he's a Texan, Paul is, you all are partakers with me of grace. You're partakers with me of grace. There's no greater word except for the word Jesus in the Bible, in my opinion. The greatest word in the Bible after you say the name Jesus is grace. G-R-A-C-E. Without grace, nothing in the Old Testament, nothing in the New. We ain't got a shot without grace. It's by the grace and the mercy of the Lord 
that we're saved. Can I hear an amen? Matter of fact, somebody should name their church Grace Church, in my opinion. <laughs> Why? Why did you name it Grace? It's all by grace. Oh, but watch this. And you've heard me say this before, but in the word grace is your race. Drop the G. What about the race you are running in grace? Well, I thought he did everything. Well, he did do everything. But by grace, you're now grafted in, and you abide in Christ. The Holy Spirit seals you. You have the Word of God. And like we learned on Sunday, last Sunday, you're now a special agent in the kingdom of heaven, representing grace here on earth until he takes us home. Amen. What, you think you're just sitting around waiting to, okay, it's all by grace. It's all, it, it is all by grace. But you're in a relationship that you have a race to run. How are you doing on your race? You say, oh, no, no, I'm just taking it easy. Well, then you better wake up. Because how you run your race makes a difference in the kingdom. And you say, no, no, yes, yes, yes. And he'll equip you. He'll give you the Holy Spirit. He'll give you a church. He'll give you accountability. He'll give you the word of God. But what you did today makes a difference in eternity. Say, well, I came to church. Amen that you're in church. Amen. Well, just make us feel better. That's my plan. I can't do that. But the Word of God can. As we all get to look out of ourselves in the mirror, in the Word of God. And to see where you are, whether you're at the beginning, whether you're halfway, or you're right at the tail end of your race. How are you doing? And you say, that's not fair. That's not in the book of Philippians. Oh, I read ahead. Just in case anybody here is trying to argue with Paul or the New Testament or me. Um, so it starts all the, he, he's going to finish what he began in you. Amen, amen. He'll complete it. You're all partakers with me of grace. But if you just turn over to page, one page to chapter three, Philippians chapter three and verse 13. Philippians chapter three, verse 13. Tell me you're looking at the word of God, right? Okay, we're, we're, we're in the same chapter. He's going to complete it. But notice what Paul says to the same group. Chapter 3, verse 13. Brethren, I do not count myself as to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. What are you talking about? I thought we got to sit back and just take it easy till Jesus takes us home. No, no going to run my race. I'm going to press forward. I'm, I'm going to discipline my body. I, I'm going to, I'm going to get ready to when I finally meet him, that maybe I'll hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Not everybody gets that. I hope, I don't know if I'll get it, but I hope I hear that, that whatever he gives me in talents, what he ever gives me in resources, that I'm not just going to bury it in the backyard and watch Netflix till I go home. I want to make sure I'm using my resources that he gave me to the fullest extent today. And by the way, I'm more than halfway through my race. Thank you. This year is 50 years with Jesus. And so I don't think I'm going to live 50 more years, but if I do, I hope I get, <laughs> I'm not going to live 50 more years. Boy, would I be really, I'd be really old, but I might have 30. Oh, come on, Pastor Bill. I might have 30. We'll see. You might have 30 minutes. I don't know. <laughs> 30 days. I don't know. But I have today to press forward when he calls me home. I, by the way, you should plan, you know, you should plan longer than you think. That's just my counsel. I'm not saying, you know, it is day by day, but you should plan. I'm looking at some of you, some of you guys, like if I got 30, well, that's 96. That's really Hey, Scott, that doesn't sound too old, though, does it? <laughs> Scott's still down. He's still down. He's still down. He's preaching and teaching and board member, and he's 87. Whoa! Way to go, Scott. Way to go. And you say, well, what, what are you getting at? Well, turn one more page, chapter 4, verse 1. Same book, Philippians, chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my beloved and longed-for brethren, my joy and crown. So, 
Stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Stand fast. Hey, Bill, you're preaching to the Wednesday night choir. I know. Stand fast. There's people out there tapped in right now. Stand fast. Reach forward. Press on. Don't, don't you drift on the Lord. He's faithful. He's faithful. He's got you. He'll complete it. But it's a relationship. And the part you play is important. Amen? Father, thank you for your word tonight in Philippians. And thank you that by your grace and your mercy, the very love of God, you gave us the Lord Jesus. And only by what he did at the cross, his only sacrifice, his substitute, substitution, Lord, for us, his perfect, spotless sacrifice. And it is sufficient. He finished the work. And we praise you for that. But we also realize within this relationship, we do have a race. We do have responsibility. And I pray as the bride of Christ that we would respond to the Lord Jesus. I pray as individuals we would understand our gifting and the power of your spirit and then the guidance of your word. And I pray, Lord, in our quiet time, in our communion with you, as well as using our gift, that, that Lord, it would bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus. So just remind us tonight, I pray we could take inventory, that you would find us to be loyal to you throughout our lives, especially, Lord, as we finish our race. So just bless us, Lord. We invite the presence of Jesus, and we invite the Holy Spirit to speak to each one individually. Uh, the ones out there on radio, the ones out there, Lord, on internet, I, I pray that they would be included, that they could feel that together with us as we open up your word. And that most of all, the Lord Jesus would receive the honor and glory. He alone is the one that's worthy. And all of God's people would say, Amen. So if you have your Bibles, go back to the book of Second Chronicles with me right now. The book of Second Chronicles, we're going through First and Second Chronicles, um, and I'm going to be in chapter 14, Second Chronicles chapter 14. That's on page 534 of a black Bible. So uh, a section back here, going to look at basically one guy, one king of Judah, and what he learned in his life, what he should have learned by the end of his life, and Asa, who is an example, I believe, to all of us, of how we should live our lives all the way to the end for his glory. And if you say, oh, I know everything about Asa. Well, I don't want to call you a liar, but I learned some stuff the last two, three work weeks about Asa that I'm thinking, okay, Lord, okay, let me learn how to run my race by looking at this guy. So Asa is a good guy. Chapter 14, tell me you're there. Chapter 14, yeah. verse 1. Hang on, here we go. So Abijah rested with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. Then Asa, his son, that would be the great-grandson of Solomon, Asa, his son, reigned in his place. In his days, the land was quiet for 10 years. Don't you love it when the land is quiet? By the way, the last two years under COVID, the land has not been quiet. But don't you remember when it was? And isn't it nice when there's a season in your life that it's quiet, that things seem to be at rest? There are seasons in life. There's seasons in our church. And I'm hoping, selfishly, for our country, there'll be another season of quiet. But I can't control that. I can only control what I am in any season by the grace of God. Chapter 14, verse 2. Asa did what was good and right in the, in the eyes of the Lord his God. For he removed the altars of the foreign gods and the high places, broke down the sacred pillars, 
and cut down the wooden images. So during this 10 years of peace, of peace, by the way, Asa's a good guy. He's a good king. He's a king in Judah. And so he's cleaning the house. He's actually removing the altars and he's getting everything. And so he does that. Verse uh, four, he commanded Judah. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers to observe the law and the commandment. He also removed the high places and the incense altars from all the cities of Judah. And the kingdom was quiet. Can I hear you say quiet? quiet? Peace and quiet. So he's cleaning things up. He's removing all the idolatry. It, there was a quiet under him. He built fortified cities in Judah for the land had rest. Can I hear you say rest? He had no war in those years, 10 years, because the Lord had given him rest. Can I hear you say rest? Hey, by the way, what do you do when it's a time of rest in your life? When things are quiet and you have a chance to like do inventory. By the way, Asa had that for 10 years. He didn't just rest, he cleaned house. It's like when you first get saved and all of a sudden you have peace and you're at rest with God. The first thing, you know, I did, probably you did too, you cleaned house. You went through your house, your life. And all that stuff you had to get rid of and all that stuff you shouldn't be looking, all those things that you shouldn't be saying, you got rid of it. You got rid of it. Hopefully you went into your physical house. You know that stuff that you should get rid of? You do that when you first come to the Lord, when you're wanting to walk with the Lord and you're at rest, you're at peace. Get rid of it. Can I hear an amen? amen. You say, I never got rid of mine. Well, then you've got some house cleaning to do. <laughs> You know what? You just, you get rid of it. All that sin stuff. See, Ace is a good guy. He comes in, he's got peace, he's got quiet, and he knows this idolatry stuff, all this altar stuff, all this stuff, it's got to go. And he had peace, and he had quiet, and he had rest. Woo! Well, what else should you do? Well, after you get the house clean, Therefore, verse 7, there's a reason why the therefore is therefore. It's there for what reason? He said to Judah, let us build these cities and make walls around them and towers and gates and bars while the land is yet before us. Because we have sought the Lord our God. We have sought him and he has given us rest on every side. So they built and prospered. What do you do when you're at rest with the Lord, when you get the house clean? Well, you ought to use that time to get ready for future war. You ought to use that time to get ready for battles that are coming. If you think it's always going to be at peace and rest in your life, you haven't read the New Testament. There's going to be a war in your life in the future. Principalities and powers are coming for you. The devil's coming like a roaring lion for you. Well, I think I'll just veg out on Netflix. What? You better use your time wisely to get ready for things that are coming. See, he, the, Ace is a good guy because he's not just going to take it easy and watch Oprah. I can't see him watching Oprah anyways, but he's going to build. He's going to get ready. He, he knows, let's use this time to study. Let's use this time to be prepared. Let's use this time to build and to fortify and to get ready. So yes, you should be at peace and quiet. That's great when you first get saved. And yet you should clean house. And yet you should be a student of God's word. You should be getting equipped. You should be getting ready for their stuff coming. Amen? Amen. Well, why do you think we're here on Wednesday night? I know why you're here on Wednesday night. Because you are trying to get ready. You could have stayed home. But you did. Thank you. Look at what he does next. So they built and prospered. Verse 8. And Asa had an army of 300,000 from Judah who carried shields and spears. And from Benjamin, 280,000 men who carried shields and drew bows. All of these were mighty men of valor. He's got 580,000 mighty men of valor. I don't know about you guys, but I want to be one of those guys. I mean, I'm just, I want to be a mighty man of valor. 
You say, what does that look like? Full armor on. Not my armor, God's armor. What's that look like? Jesus. Well, I just want to go beat somebody up. You're in the wrong testament. <laughs> Mighty men of valor in the New Testament look like Jesus. That doesn't make you a wimp. It just means we put his armor on. And you don't have to go looking for a fight. It'll come looking for you. And then we stand fast in his armor. Amen. What are we doing? Protecting all the sisters and our babies. And some of our sisters will be right there with us in the Lord's army. Amen? Amen. What are you using your rest time for, your quiet time? What are you using it for? Because tomorrow could be the biggest day of your life, and you just don't know it. Tomorrow could be the biggest battle you'll ever face in your life. It might be so impossible what's going to happen to you tomorrow that only because you rested and only because you prepared, only because you, you're one of the ones that you're a mighty man, you're a mighty woman of valor, that all of a sudden when here comes the bump ba da da you ready for it? But well, we got 580,000 men. Yeah, but the guy from Ethiopia has got a million. Next verse. Then Zerah, the Ethiopian, came out against them with an army of a million men and 300 flame-breathing tanks. Well, it doesn't say tanks. It says 300 chariots. Back in that day, a chariot was like a tank if you're on foot. And they got a million guys. That's almost two to one. And so, by the way, they didn't tweet you ahead of time saying, we're coming. You didn't get an email saying, get ready. All of a sudden, here's the Ethiopians with a million men and 300 chariots, and they want you. It's the biggest, the biggest battle Asa will face in his life. Aren't you glad he used his quiet time, his resting time to kind of get ready for it? But then all of a sudden, this is twice what he ever thought would come. 300 chariots, and he said to uh, Marisha, so Asa went out against him, and they set the troops in battle array in the valley of Zethia at, excuse me for that, uh, Mariesha. And Asa, <laughs> verse 11, Asa cried out to the Lord his God and said, uh, by the way, this is key. When you get into a battle twice as big as you ever thought you were going to be, it's a good time to pray. Amen? It's a good time to pray. So he's going to pray. It's not going to be an hour-long prayer. It's not going to be a five-minute prayer. Matter of fact, you could time me on it. He says, okay, it's a million, two to one, 300 chariots. And he said, Lord, it is nothing for you to help, whether with many or with uh, those who have no power. Help us. Can I hear you say help us? Help us. Oh, Lord our God, for we rest on you. And in your name we go against this multitude. Oh Lord, you are our God. Do not let men, man, prevail against you. What'd that take, like 25, 30 seconds? <clears throat> I can sum it up even quicker than that. Help us. Help us. By the way, <clears throat> if you're at rest, and quiet, preparing for battle. And then it comes quicker than you can imagine. Aren't you glad that it only needs, Lord, help us? Notice he didn't say, okay, <clears throat> we need more men. We need to go build some chariots. We need to run away the other way. Lord, help us. kind of like when Peter was sinking, <laughs> save me, Lord. You say, how long does that prayer take? About that long. About that long. And Jesus knows how to rescue his people. God the Father knows how to rescue his people. And so the Ethiopians, I don't care how many chariots they got. I don't care how many men they've got. I don't care what the odds are. If God is in your corner, if you're in his, problem solved.
the biggest story of his life. Ten years into it. Verse 12. So the Lord struck the Ethiopians before Asa. Can I hear an amen? amen? In other words, prayer answered, victory assured. And Judah and the Ethiopians fled. And Asa and the people who were with him pursued them to Gr. Uh, so the Ethiopians were overthrown. And they could not recover, for they were broken before the Lord and his army. And they carried away very much spoil. Now, if you've got a million guys you know, in this big old camp, there's a bunch of spoil. They get all the spoil. And they defeated all the cities around Gir. For the fear of the Lord came upon them, and they plundered all the cities, and there was exceedingly much spoil in them. So they attacked the livestock enclosures and carried off sheep and camel in abundance and returned to Jerusalem. Dun, da, 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 victory. Don't you love it when that happens? I mean, you go up, you didn't know what was going to happen. All of a sudden you have this war thing, you have this thing, and then God gives you the victory. And then you have to have to, like, hey, look what God did. Look what I did. And so chapter 14, I can put a big amen on the chapter. Asa, quiet, at rest. I can put an A plus on there. You know, he got ready for battle. I can put an A plus and a plus because he prayed, he prayed, he prayed. There's no way he should have won, but the Lord gave him the victory. And then you can go A plus, 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 because now he's got the plunder and everybody's happy. You got more sheep and camel and Jerusalem. But it looks like what a great story. And it is a great story. Hopefully you've got a story like that. And if you're brand new with the Lord, first 10 years with the Lord, you should have some stories like that. You cleaned house, you went to the Lord, you pray, it shouldn't have happened. And boom, God blessed. Who gets the glory? It ain't the end of the story. It's actually just the beginning. Well, let me ask you this question. So when you face that first battle, when you have a big miracle, when you cry out for help and God delivers you, well, what do you do then? What, what do you do after that thing's over? Notice what Asa done. Chapter 15. Now the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa. Notice this is the Holy Spirit speaking through a prophet, Azariah. So there's a fresh word coming from God to Asa right after the battle. So he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you were with him. The Lord is with you while you were with him. If you seek him, he will be found. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Well, now wait a minute, wait a minute. Hey, Asa, you did really good in chapter 14. You're doing really good coming to 15, but now a special word from the Lord comes forth and something about you better seek him. Don't you drift on him. Don't you leave him. There's a special warning coming to a man halfway through his race after a victory. You say, well, what does that sound like in the New Testament? That sounds a lot like Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, where Jesus said, ask, it'll be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Well, no, no, he already gave me rest. I already have victory. You better keep seeking the Lord. By the way, in the book of Hebrews, warning after warning after warning in the book of Hebrews, don't drift on him. Don't take it for granted. No, don't you remember to stand. We saw that in Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. Stand, stand, stand. And here's a special word coming to Asa after a victory. You better keep seeking. By the way, there's something you can learn from that. Sometimes after you get saved and you clean house and all that, and then you start putting your army together, you get ready for a battle, and then you have a great victory. Be careful. Because that's when... You might just take it easy on the Lord. Like things are going well, and look at we had the victory, now we got all this spoil and we got all this stuff. Be careful, be careful. One of the greatest dangers for us is when God gives us success. Can I hear an amen? amen. Especially if you're getting toward midlife crisis. You know that thing that happens to men and women? You say, when does that happen? Oh, well, you'll know when it happens. When you want to be a kid again, you want to have all that strength again, you want to have all that stuff again. You say, when does that happen? Well, somewhere around 38 to like 48. That's a pretty big gap in there. For you ladies, I don't know about you guys, but for guys, mine happened when I was 45. 
And all of a sudden, boy, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Be careful when you have success and you have all this plunder. You better keep seeking him. Stand fast. Don't you drift on the Lord. Don't take it for granted. The Lord is with you while you're with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Here's the illustration. For a long time, Israel, now remember, he's king of Judah, Israel, so Azariah is using Israel as an example. For a long time, Israel has been without the true God, without a teaching priest, without law. But when they were in trouble, they turned to the Lord God of Israel and sought him, and he was found by them. And in those times, there was no peace to the one who went out, nor nor to the one who came in. But great turmoil was on all the inhabitants of the lands. So nation was destroyed by nation, city by city, for God troubled them with every adversity. But you, Asa, but you be strong. Do not let your hands be weak for your work. Your work shall be rewarded. So here's a fresh victory. Here's all the spoils, but here's a warning from the Lord. Here's a fresh word from a prophet, a warning But you, Asa, you Grace Church, be strong. Do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. That's a promise. Don't you love that? You say, what work? Well, the work you're supposed to do, the gifting that you have, the Holy Spirit in you, it will be rewarded. Okay, I need to, some of you are, you know there's a reward at the end of this thing, right? You guys know that, right? Okay, yeah, I just want to go to heaven. Well, I want to go to heaven too. But you know that there's a reward at this thing, right? You know there's like a payday someday. You know that, right? And not that we do it for that, but you know there's a Christmas morning in heaven when all of your works are opened up before the Father and tried as it were by fire. And whatever's done, you know, mediocre, and you don't really put your heart into it, that, all, that stuff's all burned up. But whatever's left, that's your reward. That's what we give back to the Father. That's your present on Christmas morning. Can I hear an amen? And then he has rewards that he gives out. He has presents for you too. There's all kinds of crowns and rewards and things. And well done, my good and fast. Woohoo! You don't want to find out about that then. You want to know about that now. So we don't do it for that. But you know what? I still, I want to work on my gift for my father. And who knows what he's going to give me? There are rewards. So that's the message for Asa. Be careful. Don't give up. Seek him. Stay working. There are rewards. Which you can lose. Wouldn't you hate it if you had the winning lottery ticket? And the number flashed up. And then you pull out your ticket and say, I won five million dollars. And then you lost the ticket. There are rewards. To some he gives ten talents, to some five, and to some one. By the way, it's never yours. It's all his. But when you take the five and turn it to ten, the two to four, or the one to two, it's still his. But somehow what you do with his talents (laughs) means you get to be the mayor of ten cities. Think about that for a second. That's a biblical illustration of how it's bigger than we understand with what's coming. You don't want to be the guy with one talent that said, well, I know you were a hard and cruel taskmaster, so I just buried it in the backyard. Let me go dig up your one talent. Woo, he's really ticked off at that guy. Should have put it in the bank. At least I would have got, well, what, 0.03% interest, whatever. But you buried it? Give it to the guy with 10. 
Well, that's not fair. Yeah, it's fair because I want you to multiply what I've given to you. Don't you understand? It's your reward. And if you don't use it right, then I'll take it and give it to somebody who will. That's all part of the thing. So what's the point? Be very, very careful of success. And be very, very careful that you hear the fresh word of the Lord. Because most of you in this room, you're about 10 years into this deal. Maybe 20. And so you know what I'm talking about. Ace is an example. And and, in chapter 14, he gets an A+. But in chapter 15, what's he going to do with new opportunities and new resources and a fresh word from God? Well, he's going to get an A plus in this chapter too. Because he just came off his biggest victory his biggest temptation after the victory, when Asa, verse 8, heard these words and the prophecy of Oded, the prophet, that's Azariah, he took courage. He took courage and removed the abominable idols from all the land of Judah. There's still a fresh cleaning to do. There's a fresh with all the stuff and all the spoils that they got, of the land of Judah and Benjamin from all the cities, which he had taken in the mountains of Ephraim. And he restored, not only did he remove everything that was wrong, but he restored everything that was right. He restored the altar of the Lord. Can I hear you say, restored the altar of the Lord? It's one thing to clean house and get rid of the stuff that's wrong. Remove it. It's another thing to restore Your quiet time. Your altar before the Lord. See, if you're hearing the fresh word from God after a victory and you realize you still have to seek him, you still have to find him, you still have to pay attention, there's still more things to clean and there's more things to repair. If I said it this way, how's your altar? How's your personal altar before the Lord? Where's it set up at? What I mean by that, where, where, will you, where are you going to have your devotions in the morning? Where are you going to spend time with God? How much time are you going to spend with God? Are you paying attention to what's going on in your life? And you say, I just want to get through life. Well, so do I with peace and quietness and safety. But that's in preparation for the war that's surely coming. And when the war comes, guess what? You'll pray that 30-second prayer. Then God will give you a victory. And then all of a sudden, with that success, you might have more stuff you had before. And so then the warning comes again from God. Be very, very careful. You better seek me. Better find me. Don't you go wandering on me now. So Asa, once again, goes back and he starts looking for more stuff to clean it up and get rid of it. Praise God. Some of us might need to do a fresh house cleaning. It's been 10 years. Well, what's your house look like? What's crept in? What did you get rid of before that now you might have to get rid of again? Are you, see, I'm, I'm just letting the Holy Spirit tell you. I don't, don't tell me. And how's your altar? By the way, I was awake last night for like three hours. I didn't know I was going to throw this in on you, but I might as well. Why were you awake for three hours? Because God was talking to me in a personal way. And I had some house cleaning to do in my life. I'm glad he didn't strike me with leprosy. Or paralyze me with fear. We have a loving Father that comes in and talks with us, and a Holy Spirit that communicates to us. And then when we get up in the morning, whatever time that is for you, you have the profound privilege of controlling your schedule to where you can find some time with you and God. And I'm glad we have cell phones, and we can tap in on YouTube, and we can come to church. But we all have altars that need to be tended and repaired so God can deal with us at a personal level. It's not a scary thing, unless you ain't got one. By the way, Ace is getting A pluses so far in chapter 15. Amen? 
You say, well, where is he? Well, he's more than halfway through his walk with the Lord, and he had rest and peace, and now he restored the altar of the Lord that was before the vestibule of the Lord. Then he gathered all Judah, verse 9. He gathered all Judah and Benjamin and those who dwelt with them from Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon. For they came over to him in great numbers from Israel. They're coming over to Judah. When they saw that the Lord, his God, was with them. Guess what? His country, his kingdom's growing now. Why? Because people round about from Israel say, we're going over there with Asa. Asa's got it. Asa's A plus king. Let's go over with him. You actually have growth right there. By the way, I don't know about you, but I love it when growth happens. I, I just do. I, I do. There's new people in the house tonight. There's brand new people in the house. Thank you for coming. What does that mean? Well, you came for some reason. I'm glad you're here. And you say, well, you've got a lot of Bible that you're giving us. We still got a chapter and a half to go. So hang on. And you say, well, why do you do that? Because I want you to know that, you know, that's one thing sheep are hungry for. So my theory is feed them a lot on Wednesday. Feed them a lot. What do, you, what do you do with it? But I'm, I'm grateful for the growth and, and the Lord. Last, last Sunday, we uh, finally, for the first time in two years since COVID started, our treehouse ministry was full. Can I hear an amen? amen. We had like 200 kids here Sunday. 200 kids. It's like, wow, you got to go back two years for that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. There's a bunch of kids back in youth group right now. Can I hear an amen? Amen, um, amen, amen. And by the way, tomorrow... We've got a grief share thing happening tomorrow. If you need that, then anybody's welcome to come to that. That's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, we got our Wednesday night meals coming back this month, right, Paige? I'm, I'm here to, and Paige is going to do hamburgers herself. Personally ordered. For, I, okay, I'm making that up. But anyways, <laughs> I'm sorry, Paige. There's a, so I'm just telling you, life's coming back. Growth is happening. And that's good. When, when people figure out, hey, you got a good king over there and things are going good and you cleaned the house and you got the altar set up, right. And so they want to be with them. Verse 10, so they gathered together at Jerusalem. Great place to gather. In the third month of the 15th year of the reign of Asa. So he's into the, the 15th year. And so he's halfway through, a well, little less than halfway. They offered to the Lord at that time 700 bulls and 7,000 sheep for the spoil that they had brought. Then they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul. And whoever would not seek the Lord of the Lord God of Israel would be put to death. Uh, by the way, that's the old covenant. That's not the new covenant. Unless you're Jesus. By the way, Jesus took the death that we don't have to take. Because the new covenant, Jesus gave his life. And he was put to death so that we could have life. That's why I don't want to skip that too quick. If you don't come next Wednesday, we won't put you to death. Because <laughs> Jesus already did for us. Whether small or great, whether man or woman. Uh, verse 14, then they took an oath before the Lord with a loud voice, with shouting of trumpets and ram's horn. And all Judah rejoiced. What a great time. You have revival and worship. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with, their, with all their heart, and they sought him with all their soul. And he was found by them, and the Lord gave them rest. There's the word again all around. Can I hear an amen? amen. They say you get an A plus again. Way to go. Way to go. You listen to the fresh voice. The fresh warning from the Lord, you removed, you restored. Everybody's coming. Everybody's committed. Uh, you have a revival and you have worship right there. Verse 16. Also, Asa removed Mecha. He removed Mecha, the mother the grandmother. It can be either way in the Hebrew. Asa removed his mom or his grandmother of Asa the king from being queen mother. Now wait, now, whoa, 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 whoa. It's getting really personal. It's getting into the family. You're, you're taking your mom out? You're getting rid of grandma? Yep. Do you know why? She's a pervert. You say, how do you know that? I read ahead. He removed his mom, his grandma, from being queen mother because she had made an obscene image of Asherah. 
And Asa cut down her obscene image, then crushed the obscene image, burned it by the brook Kindred. But the high places were not removed from Israel. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was loyal. Can I hear you say loyal? loyal. All his days. He also brought into the house of God the things that his father had dedicated and that he himself had dedicated silver and gold and utensils into the house of God. And there was no war until the 35th year of the reign of Asa. By the way, you know that it's really, really working when all of a sudden, not only do you clean your own house, but then you want to clean mom's house. Or dad's house. You're, not going to, you're just not going to tolerate it in your life. And you can do your own study on what he had to cut down. It was vile. But he got rid of the sin. Even though that meant messing with mom or grandmother. I have a very godly mom, by the way. She only had to mess with me <laughs> in that sense. But Doug and I know what it's like to have a father that there are some things you just can't tolerate. You just can't. And then things get really, really interesting. But holy. Amen? So what are you saying? Oh, by the way, Asa gets an A plus in chapter 14. Asa gets an A plus in chapter 15. And matter of fact, for 35 years, this guy, things are great. Things are great. He's at peace. He's at, faced the big battle. He had spoils, worship, committed to the Lord. And he lived happily ever after. Nope, we got chapter 16. The sermon starts now. Chapter 16, verse 1. In the 36th year of the reign of Asa. He's only got five to go. You made it 35 years with A pluses. You only got five years to go, Asa. Basha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah. That he might let none go out nor come in to Asa, king of Judah. So what this Basha does in Israel, he actually, up by Jerusalem, he, he's actually going to build a, a city, Ramah. He's going to shut down I-40 going into Jerusalem. Now, there again, Asa's in Jerusalem, and all of your trading and all your buying and selling. So Basha figures out in Israel, I know how to build the right city in the right place to where I-40 is not working any longer. So he's going to cut off all the supply. He's going to take over. By the way, compared to a million men from Ethiopia, this is, this is not such a big deal. It, it'd be like if I, out there somewhere, uh, let me pick on some, um, who should I pick on? Will Dorado. I'll pick on Will Dorado, okay? Uh, I could pick on, I'll pick on Bushland because Mike's from Bushland. It, it'd be like if Bushland all of a sudden said, we're going to make our city overlap I-40 so nobody can get to Amarillo. Well, don't do that, Bushland. Or we're just going to take you out. I mean, we'll go around you. We'll build the loo. I'm, I'm just saying, that's not a big problem compared to if a million guys are coming from Oklahoma City to take over Amarillo. All right, I'm just trying to give you an illustration. You understand what I'm saying? So here's Basha showing up saying, hey, we're going we're gonna to shut it down. Well, after a million guys from Ethiopia, Ethiopia that's, that's not a big deal. Unless you think it's not a big deal. Verse 2, then Asa brought silver and gold from the treasuries of the house of the Lord. Where are you getting the money? From God's house and of the king's house. What are you going to do with it? He sent to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria. That's the enemy, by the way, who dwelt in Damascus, saying, let there be a treaty between you and me, as there's been between my father and your father. See, I've sent you money and gold, silver and gold. Come break your treaty with Basha, king of Israel, so that he will withdraw from me. Now, what are you doing, Asa? Well, I can solve this problem. This is not a big problem. I just need to take some money out of the Lord's house, go over here, get the king of Syria. Ben and dad, hey, if I bribe you with the money that I got from God, will you be on my side so Basha can't build and then I can have I-40 again going through Amarone? I mean, I, I can fix this. Be very, very careful when you get to the end of your life, the last five years of your life. You say, well, I've done everything right for 35 years. A plus, A plus. But there's something that can happen to old men 
or people that have had success, people that God has really blessed. You get to a problem, you think this is not that big a deal. I'll just fix it. I won't even pray about it. I'll wheel and deal over here. I'll go find the guy. I'll, I'll figure out how to, okay, hey, come fix Bushland. And Will Dorado says, okay, we'll take care of that. Problem solved. Matter of fact, it might look like it even works. It might even work. Because notice what happens. So Benadad heeded King Asa, verse 4, sent captains of his army against the cities of Israel. They attacked Ijon, Dan, Abel, Miam, uh, all the storage cities of Naphtali. Now it happened when Asa heard of it that he stopped building Ramah and ceased his work. I 40 is open. Then King Asa took all Judah and they carried away the stones and the timbers of Ramah, which Basha had used for building. And with them he built uh, Geba and Mizpah. And so you look at that and you think, hey, it worked, it worked. Did it really work? You just cut a deal with God's money. You made a deal with the enemy. And you think it worked. And at that time, Hanani the seer, here's a new prophet. Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, because you have relied, you've relied on the king of Syria and have not relied on the Lord your God. Therefore, the army of the king of Syria has escaped. He's escaped from your hand. Were the Ethiopians, remember, a million guys? And Lubum, not a huge army with very many 300 chariots and horsemen. Yet because you relied back then, you relied on the Lord. He delivered you. He delivered them from your hand. I think it's the key to all of Asa's life. Verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal. Can I hear you say loyal? loyal. Whose heart is loyal to him. And this you've done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, you shall have wars. The way I did 35 years, and then on the 37th year, you mean because I messed up on the 36th year, you, you made a treaty. You didn't even pray about it. You relied on your smarts, on your resources, on your wheel and dealing. It looks like it worked, but it didn't work. You forgot about God. So now you're going to have wars. By the way, Asa doesn't get an A plus in chapter 16. Matter of fact, he didn't even get a C minus in chapter 16. He's going to get an F in chapter 16. You say, well, no, that's not an F. Well, not yet it's not. Because at that point in time, he should have repented. When Hananiah, therefore, from now on, you shall have wars. And there should be right after that verse 10, you see, Asa was remorseful and cried for the mercy of God and repented, but it doesn't say that. Then Asa, what it actually says was angry with the seer. I thought, wait, wait, wait. Hey, Asa, are you so old? You're getting mad at the prophet? You've always listened to the word of God before. You heeded when God had a fresh word from you from this word, but now you're mad at the messenger? What, you didn't like the message that he had for you? So Asa was angry with the seer and put him in prison. You did What? I put him in prison, for he was enraged at him because of this. He said, you're mad at God. You're mad at God's message. You're mad at God's messenger. And they said, posed some of the people at that time. Now you're mad at God's people. Do you, do you see what's happening at the end of this guy's life? He was fine, A plus, A plus, A plus. And then all of a sudden, because he didn't stop, he didn't think, he didn't pray, he just thought, well, I can fix that problem. The right treaty with the right guy and a problem. Well, except you left God out. So then God in his grace comes to rebuke him. God in his grace sends him a new seer. By the way, when God does that with you, how do you respond? Well, I'll find another church. I'll find another preacher. I'll find another. Be very, very careful. 
Can I see the quote by Guzik? Asa shows us the tragedy of a man who rules well, seeks the Lord for many years, yet fails in a significant challenge of his faith, and then refuses to hear God's correction. Oh, Asa, overall, you're a good king. Overall, God used you. Overall, there was times of rest. Overall, you had a victory over a million men. But at the end, you lost it. Scott Davey, don't let that happen to me. If you see me losing it, come beat me. Not with your Bible. Find a board or something. Come beat me. Or all of a sudden, you know, because this happens to old men, to old, old women. You think, well, you know, well, we've been there, done that. Now we can be very careful with the last five years of your life. Verse 11, note the acts of Asa first and last. I like the way the Holy Spirit recorded that. Note the acts of Asa, the first and the last, are indeed written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And in the 39th year of his reign, the 39th year of his reign, Asa became diseased in his feet. And his malady was severe. Yet in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but the physicians. By the way, it's very appropriate to call the doctor after you've called the doctor. Unless you think, I'm so mad at God, I'm not going to call him. What kind of foot disease did he have? Bad enough he dies from it. So Asa rested with his fathers. He died in the 41st year of his reign. They buried him in his own tomb, which he had made for himself in the city of David. They laid him in the bed, which was filled with spices and various ingredients, prepared in a mixture of ointments. They made a very big bonfire, great burning for him. And that doesn't mean he cremated him. It just means, okay, he was a good king. A lot of good stuff, but the last five years of his life. I'm sorry, Asa. See, it's not how you start your race. It's how you finish your race. Hebrews chapter 12. And with that, I'm done. Hebrews chapter 12. Verses 1 and 2. It's on page 1478. The New Testament, the writer of Hebrews. By the way, in Hebrews, we're warned over and over again, don't drift on the Lord, don't leave the Lord, don't, don't, don't do that. But in chapter 12, and I know you guys know this, but verse 1, chapter 12, verse 1 of Hebrews, therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run, Grace Church, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, has sat down at the right hand of the Lord, of the throne, excuse me, the right hand of the throne of God. So what's the point? Be loyal in your race to finish as you continue to seek God himself. Amen? Don't be spoiled by past success. Make sure you continue because there's more stuff coming. There is. And don't take for granted. Please don't take for granted that you can fix it. Because you think you're smart enough or rich enough or have enough connections. You pray about it. You pray about it. Let God get the glory. Amen? Asa. Asa. I just thought of something. 
And uh, you've heard me say this, and Asa failed at the end. So in the word grace, you have a raise. Drop the G, right? Raise. Depending how you run your race, drop the R, you can be an ace in your race, in grace, instead of a Asa. <laughs> I, I, just, I literally just thought of that. Don't be a, don't be a, don't be a, don't be an Asa. Be an ace. I better stop. Huh. In your race. For, for Christ's glory. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the, the word of God in this marvelous thing we call grace. And what that means to us, Lord, because we do not deserve it. We need your mercy, Lord, and you are faithful. You are faithful. You are faithful. And you do finish what you begin. And, and I'm grateful, Lord, if you look at Asa's whole life, he goes down as a good guy. Overall, it's just a lousy five years at the end. I pray your protection, Lord, and your spirit with my last five years. I don't know when that's going to be. It might be right now. And for my friends here, the last five years, that it wouldn't be whatever earthly wisdom or insight or wheel and dealing or what it, that Lord, it wouldn't. We would pray and seek your face to the very end. And when we do mess up and when we are confronted by the word of God, that Lord, we, we wouldn't get angry at you. We wouldn't get angry at the messenger. We wouldn't get angry at your people. But instead, we'd repent. And maybe there's people here online that, Lord, what they heard tonight, they need to clean their house again. They need to pay attention, Lord, to their altar. That place, Lord, where they hang out with you. There could be somebody here tonight, Lord, man, they've been wheeling and dealing with their own resources and it's a warning to them. It's a warning. Or maybe we've enjoyed too much quiet time and peace that we're not preparing, we're not preparing for the next war. So whatever the application, Lord, to all the different ones in the room and online, I trust the Holy Spirit to do that with the word tonight. That the end of my life and the end of my friends here, Lord, would bring honor and glory to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. And we would keep our eyes fixed on him and would run for his glory. Could be you're here tonight and you just really aren't connected to Jesus the way you should be. This thing of grace, you've never thought about it before, but how you have to be in that. You have to receive that. And you trying to impress God with a race but not connected by grace doesn't do any good to anybody. So before we close with this last song, just you might be here tonight, you just need to be saved. Or there might be something you need to get right with the Lord from the sermon. Whichever one it is, I'm just going to ask you to stand that before we close this service, give me a chance just to pray with you. And if that's you tonight, just stand and we'll pray for you right now. Is there anybody? Anybody else? Anybody else?
Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for work that you do within our hearts as we hear the Word of God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you still talk to people within their soul, their spirit. Your personal God. I pray for the ones that are standing, Lord, and I pray that in your grace and your mercy, you would restore them and heal them and bless them. I pray that whatever house cleaning they might need to do or restoration of whatever altars they might need to build, I pray, Lord, that you would would bless them. And all of us in that sense, Lord. Thank you for this day and thank you for a fresh start tomorrow if you should tarry. And for these, Lord, if they need salvation or sanctification, we trust you with that, that precious work of your spirit and of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That whatever we face, whatever obstacles, Lord, whatever wars, whatever chariots that come against us, remind us that by grace we've been grafted in, we get to abide in the vine, the greatest story ever told, and we're a part of it for your glory. So I thank you for Grace Church tonight, and I thank you for your word, thank you for your spirit. And I thank you for these that stand, Lord, that Jesus, you would receive all of the honor and all the glory. And God's people would say, you guys want to thank the ones that are standing and the Lord that. And would you stand with them as we close our service? I love you guys.